Welcome to the Sourcing Hero podcast produced by Una, a group purchasing organization that empowers sourcing heroes and Art of Procurement, the world's largest procurement podcast network. I'm your host, Kelly Barner. The goal of the Sourcing Hero podcast is to capture the epic stories of people who are rising up and beating the odds to create exceptional value within procurement directly from those heroes themselves. Today, my guest here on the Sourcing Hero podcast is Jason Edmonds. Jason is the co-founder and COO at Mentee, and he's a 2023 Venture for America fellow. He's a lifelong learner who's passionate about operational systems and product development, and is a startup enthusiast that seeks to revolutionize the college admissions industry with efficient, impactful solutions. So uh, hi, Jason. Thank you so much for being with me. It's an honor. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm really excited. This is actually my uh, first podcast I've ever done, so I'm looking forward to it. That is very cool. Well, we're glad to be your first. Um, That way we also know we'll be your very best. Uh, (laughs) I shared a little bit about your area of focus and where you work and some of your background in my intro, but what else do you think it's helpful for people to know about your professional journey? Yeah, well, I I guess I'll talk a little bit more about myself and I'll kind of move that into my professional journey as I kind of go along. Um, But I'm a former tennis player, so played tennis all my life growing up. Um, I'm a big time sports fan, so I've been watching a lot of, I don't know, have you been watching the uh, NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament this year? I have been. You you can't not follow Caitlin Clark. (laughs) Yeah, it's been incredible to watch. Um, I think it's been, I'm going to watch the men's final again tonight, but it's been really fun to watch that. But I guess professionally, yeah, I was a Venture for America fellow, as you said, and really found the love for entrepreneurship going through that program and starting Mentee on my own. And through that, as a CEO, I've kind of taken a lot of the product development roles at Mentee, and I've really fallen in love with creating and building great products. It's been super cool to see how everything comes together from the design of something to the backend functionality, um, to trying to take in different customer requests and feedback, trying to make the product just that 1%, 2% a little bit better. Um, So it's been a really cool journey to watch. And I'm really lucky to feel like I found something that I'm so passionate about at such a young age. Now, you talked a little bit about building product and operationalizing the work that you do at, at Mentee, but yeah. it's a very human enterprise that, that you're working in. Can you talk a little bit more about the goals of the organization and maybe even a bit about how the company came about? Yeah, sure. So the goal of Mentee is really to help revolutionize the college research industry. I feel a lot of times that when people are looking to choose a certain college, there's a lot of promotional materials, there's a lot of marketing, and that's because schools are doing their best to really sell themselves to the students. And so what we're trying to do is try to put power into the students themselves and have real conversations with real students. So all of our mentors are vetted um, by us personally. They're real people at different schools and they can really give the on the ground insights that you really can't get elsewhere. Furthermore, I think it's just like a fun way to learn about college. Um, I think that's something that kind of goes under the radar is like talking to someone that's your own age is just a little bit less intimidating and a little bit more approachable than talking to someone who, no offense to <laughs> anyone else, but someone who's maybe 20, 30 years out of college, for example, like a typical <laughs> college counselor. So um, yeah, I think that's definitely a fun dynamic there as well. Um, and then I can talk a little, oh, sorry, go for it. <laughs> no, no, that's all right. You're going to talk a little bit about maybe how the company came to be. Yeah, sure. I, I could talk a little bit about how the company came to be. So this really actually started as like a summer project between my co-founder, Crystal, and myself. Just some background on us, actually. We actually met in the fifth grade. Um, we went to the same middle school, same high school, ended up going to college around 30 minutes away from each other. So you can kind of say our lives have been in parallel for around the longest time. Uh, but yeah, I've got to do a business with my best friend. And I will say that this is really based on my own personal experience going through the college process. I remember almost five years ago now, which is crazy to think about back when I was uh, a senior, tried to make a decision between Northeastern University and Haverford College. And my I didn't really know what my life would look like at either of those schools. It was very difficult to envision. One was a large research university. The other was a small liberal arts school. And I had a really tough time. I was so stressed out about it. I actually ended up waiting to like the very last day to make my decision. <laughs> um, so I really designed Menti 
based off of what I would have wanted as a high school student was to be able to talk to people from different schools. And granted, I got lucky in the end. I think Harvard was a great choice for me, but I know like my co-founder Crystal was not so lucky and she ended up having the transfer from her first college um, after her freshman year. Okay. Well, and it's interesting because you're clearly focused on the college space and mentoring relationships to facilitate that decision-making process. But depending on what field you go into, mentoring continues. Yeah. People have the opportunity to be mentored or be mentors, right, as they go through their career. Sometimes yeah. people will even get involved in, let's say, community organizations where it's it's a step away from work. And I'm interested in some of what you've learned about what ultimately determines the strength of a mentoring relationship. So what are the connections that would allow someone looking to share their wisdom and someone looking to access that wisdom to really connect as individuals and build a strong relationship? Yeah, I think the key is really approachability and compatibility. I would like to narrow it down to just two things. At Menti, we try to really pair people based on their different interests. And so if someone is, if someone is say, looking to go into college for economics, mm -hmm. um, that the, the experience of a computer science student may not be as relevant to them because they're not going to go through the same challenges or the same obstacles as them. Similarly, if you want to compare that to like the career space, for example, if I wanted to go into product management and I talk to someone who is, you know, in business development, for example, it might be helpful to me to learn a little bit about their career path, but it's not going to be fully what my experience is going to be going for. And so what we try to do is we really try to make sure that those matches are really great. They have really great life backgrounds. For example, if someone has unique experience of being, say, a first-generation low-income student, we want to make sure that they have someone who's talking to them who's also of that same um, demographic. And then I would say the other piece of it, besides compatibility, is just approachability. And I think mm -hmm. that's just kind of like an inherent and natural thing that we're lucky to have as part of our system. But to be honest, having someone who's friendly, just easy to talk to you right off the bat and honestly relatable that has to go back into the compatibility portion of it, I think it's like a really helpful and comforting feeling to make you feel as if you're not alone throughout the entire process. Yeah. So some of what you're trying to capture in this, even before you start pairing people up is, you know, what yeah. type of college program is it? What are the interests? Things that can be very easily captured, even yeah. in a spreadsheet, right? I'm sure it's a lot more sophisticated than that. <laughs> very straightforward. What, what, what was your degree in or or what are some of your interests and then there's that personality element right um it, you know when you talk about approachability certainly that's a, a soft skill that's going to be useful absolutely everywhere and how are you trying to determine or talk about that level of approachability on an individual level how do you capture some of those more personal elements yeah, it's really tough to capture some of the more personal elements, to be honest. It's one of the things that we always struggle with at Menti, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times, especially in the college admissions industry, you can really get reduced down to just statistics. What major am I going to pick? What's the acceptance rate here? What's the average SAT score here? And it really kind of like narrows it down and puts students into a box, I feel. And so we try to get different information about people's backgrounds too. We try to get information about just their general interests. So like even on our application form to become a mentor, you have to list different interests about yourself. So okay. You might see, oh, this person the karaoke, this person <laughs> like, likes playing golf, this person, you know, likes doing whatever. And you might not be able to find exactly, maybe exactly fits your interests, but you can at least see who they, uh, they are as a person. Uh, another thing that we try to do is we have a conversation with all of our mentors before they're actually onboarded onto the platform. We make sure we take the time to get to actually like meet them as people so we know who our mentors really are. Um, and so that really helps in terms of approachability. We want to make sure that mentors are doing this for the right reasons yeah. to actually help students and give advice and be that guiding light for them as they're really going on to that next part of their lives, as opposed to just doing it for like monetary reasons or whatever else. Yeah. Now, how do you measure the relative success of either different mentors or different mentor-mentee pairings? Yeah, it's a really good question. Honestly, that is, this is an area that I want to get a lot better at. <laughs> um, so far, we've been a little bit more qualitative, and I want to get a little bit more quantitative as we kind of go through that process. But I'll give you a couple of different examples. So we have a current student right now. His name is Max. And what we do is we actually watch every single session 
that they go through. So yeah, we're able to record all, all the different sessions and then we're able to watch through all of them just to, you know, see what they're like, what kind of questions students are asking mm-hmm. and how our mentors can, you know, best fit them. And Max in the beginning, it was a little, I, I, it was a little bit tough because, you know, obviously um, he, he, he was a high school student and a lot of high school students, right? It's a little bit, they're not, they're not like going to be sitting upright, taking notes all the time. And I just see like how he's been able to progress and how he's been able to like gain some of these networking skills, these soft skills, as you said, about talking to other people who are close in age, sharing different ideas and really contributing to the conversation as well. And now, like, I think in this last meeting, he was like, sitting up like looking really um professional i guess he was taking notes throughout the call and it was really cool to see he was asking a lot of questions about like career options you know which career should i navigate and i think that improvement has been really rewarding to watch over time so i would say it's less of a quantitative thing at the moment we want to get more to that but right now it's a lot more quality and that has to be incredibly rewarding can you talk about the fact that you're watching all of the interviews to see someone progress and and truthfully as you're approaching going to college so at your 17 16 yeah, maybe 18 on the outside <laughs> yeah i mean you're practically still a baby at that point there's so <laughs> much development that has to happen exactly and this must just accelerate it almost by making it an iterative process right because you can go through more of these conversations when it's something that's facilitated digitally you're not right. just waiting to get to college interviews and you're only going to get to do so many of those I, and I, exactly. And I, I think the key thing here is you try to make it fun too. Like yeah. you have to try to make it fun. You have to make it fun for the student to want to keep coming back and keep learning from this mentor. And so we try to incorporate small things like different activities or fun little uh, myth busting, different or myth busting okay. college type of deal. Um, just small things like that. They really try to keep them engaged because you're right. There is so much development that has to happen. Even for me personally, I, I'm I'm finished college now, and I still feel like I'm developing every single day and yeah. learning a lot of new things. So I can, I mean, I, my high school self would definitely uh, be a lot more in the churches for that. Yeah. Well, and let's talk about that a little bit because you had mentioned at the start of our conversation that this was like a summer side project, and right. now you've grown it into a company. It's something that you're formalizing. You're building technology around it and data and, and analytics. Yeah. What has that process been like for you, sort of stepping into both a leadership role, but also trying to formalize something from being sort of a fun project into being a company that can be scaled and and grown and continue to help more and more people? To be transparent, I really struggle with this, um, to be honest. So I just had a conversation with my co-founder yesterday. And she was talking a little bit about as we've been able to operationalize things and as we've been able to grow, you do naturally, I feel, lose a little bit of that initial excitement that you had when you were first starting it. You lose a little bit of the, you know, the, the world's our oyster and we can do anything that we want. And things start to get a little bit more real, right? Like at some point, like traction does matter, results do matter, and you have to really start, you know, growing things. And there's expectations on you, especially like in a startup that's supposed to be as fast growing as we are. And so it's been a really tough balance because you want to have that urgency and you want to create those processes to move your company forward. But you also don't want to lose the creativity, the innovation, yeah. the excitement that actually got you there. And so I would say, Kelly, kind of, this is something that we still struggle with to this day. I think finding that balance has been so difficult. Yeah, I, I can share a few tips, I guess, that have really helped me. Yeah, that would be great. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think setting setting aside time for both is really important. So um, making sure that you have some time to be creative and to be innovative and just have like pure brainstorming sessions, and then sometimes where you're really just focused on operationalizing something. Because I remember at the beginning we used to have these like four hour, five hour brainstorming sessions, and we would just it wouldn't be capped. It would go on way too long, and we just kind of like <laughs> talk ourselves around in circles. So I try to put like a time limit on all of our meetings now of like, we're going to brainstorm for an hour. So we, don't, we, don't, we don't get too far down the rabbit hole. And then I guess the second thing would be to convert things from an idea to an action as quickly mm-hmm. as possible. So whenever we think of a really good idea that we're both in agreement with, we're like, okay, what are like the three action steps for like what it would take to actually make this happen? And by then you can really start going from creativity to action very quickly. Um, and so those are some of the strategies that we need to use, but as I said, it's, it's definitely a big struggle for us. Yeah. No. And you know what, you know, you talked about accessibility, 
um, with the mentors. I think being transparent about what the entrepreneurial journey is, is that's incredibly helpful to people. It's, it is not easy. Um, not, yeah. <laughs> and it's funny because I, I don't have it in front of me, but just in the paper this morning, there was a review of a book that's out from like Google's productivity manager. She's written this book. Oh. And it's so funny because a lot of what you just said is actually in the review as being sort of highlights from the book. One of the things she talks about, if you're going to put an action item on your to-do list or your parking lot, you know, however you manage ideas from a brainstorming session, right. make sure it starts with a verb. Because yeah. it, you're, if you're already thinking in terms of being able to action something, if you actually start the task with a verb, it even shortens that distance. And so That's figuring some of those things out, um, and even in terms of figuring things out, one of the things you and I had talked about previously is that you have some groups of students that maybe have different needs than the typical right. kid getting ready to go to college. And so figuring out what they need and being able to help them. One of the groups that you had talked about were international students. Yeah. What are some of the unique needs that they have and how have you sort of built Mentee up to support them? Well, first of all, international students are increasing in the U.S. at very rapid paces. Uh, I think there's like been a 33% increase in international students year over year. It's definitely something that we're trying to follow all the time and trying to learn a little bit more about. But I think the really the most important thing about trying to understand the international population, we knew that this was a target from the very beginning because of just the distance away from America and mm -hmm. how difficult it could be to actually envision your life at college as an international student. Yeah. I personally had a lot of international friends in college, and I saw like firsthand how difficult it was for them to really transition to college. So this isn't just like, this is a personal issue for me as well, is really trying to find resources to help them navigate the transition because... I can tell you, like, it's it's definitely not easy. There's so many different stressors that these students face. Just the fact that they even have to, you know, fight to really stay in the country, especially at college, is incredibly, it's, it's actually insane. Uh, but, you know, beyond that, I think just trying to learn that the education system in those countries, like India, China, Korea, Japan, it's very different than in the U.S. And... You know, they grow up in an environment that's drastically different. They have, in China, they have, for example, like my mom, she took the Gao Kao when she was growing up. And it's one test that literally decides your college future. Wow. And so, if it's literally just that, there is no holistic element to the system, right? It is literally just about the ranking and the stats. And so a lot of our work actually is not really as much on the holistic approach to it. It's actually about, there's a re-education component to it, actually, where it's like, yeah. There needs to be some kind of outlet to see different ways of doing things because it's really difficult. It's so competitive over there. People are working. They're studying 10, 11, 12 hours a day for these tests that decide, that essentially decide their future. And so the biggest realization for Crystal and I has been actually trying to realize that and see how we can best help these students because it's very different than how we would help someone in the U.S. Yeah. And then even within the U.S., the other group that you talked about supporting are first generation college bound students that may be from low income families or communities what are some of the special considerations around helping them get the information they need to pick the right school well first of all we also have to understand the issues there as well so i'm very lucky and privileged to really have had the resources that i had growing up mm -hmm. and to have the uh the support system behind me to really help navigate college and luckily for me college was it was, it was still a challenge for me, even with all those resources to navigate college. But a lot of times people talk about different hidden curriculums, and I really do believe that those are true. Um, as a first-generation low-income student, it's it's very difficult to know, you know where to find the mental health resources on campus or where to find the affinity spaces that may be best for you. And so what we've specifically done is we've been hosting a lot of free, free webinars for all types of people, but in particular, we've partnered with this one nonprofit called Girls on Campus. Okay. They're really focused on providing internship opportunities for uh, women of color, as well as first generation student, first generation low income students. And we're, we had a we had a whole event talking about some of the barriers in the healthcare industry, especially mm -hmm. for women. And that was a really revealing event for me personally because I don't obviously I I don't come from that perspective. I don't share that same identity, and so it was really sure. cool to hear about the experiences of others who had you know 
um, face that discrimination throughout the healthcare industry and hear their experiences. So I think that was a real example of an event that might have helped some of those students. Yeah. Um, well, Jason, we have a tradition here at the Sourcing Hero Podcast. Yeah. So every guest, their first time, gets this pairing of questions. So I'm going to give you two options. You okay. can pick either question, and there are no wrong answers. So okay. here are your options. Either what does the idea of a Sourcing Hero mean to you? Or if we look at it a little bit more broadly, what do you think heroism looks like in a business context? A and I'm kind of torn between the two. <laughs> um, I'll take the last. I'll take the last one. Okay. What does heroism look like? I think I have a little bit of a different perception of what heroism means. I think that in the beginning, I thought I meant taking on a lot of different roles myself and being able to single handedly be able to take care of different parts of the business. Uh, you know, I can do the operations. I can do this. I can do that. I could put this on my plate. And as I've kind of grown up throughout this business, I've realized that heroism really is. I mean, everyone, if you're going to be a founder, you're going to be self-motivated. You're going to be driven. That's without a doubt. You're going to want to do everything. But I realize that heroism is really having the self-awareness and really the humility to accept when you've made mistakes or when you're holding others back, to be honest. And that was one of the hardest things to admit to myself is like, hey, by taking on all these different responsibilities and maybe not doing any one of them super well, I'm actually holding my team back. And I feel like my form of heroism is having to take the humility and the self-awareness to be like, hey, I need to take a step back. This is not actually my strong suit. And I need to be able to trust my team and the people around me to really take care of that for me. So I remember when we were first building our product, I used to be like super hands-on. I was touching everything. And I was like really in the weeds trying to like learn this product. And I think it's good to be in the details to an extent, right? I think that was like really good for my learning of the platform and to figure out how to build things. But my team's feedback was actually, I think we want to really own and take control of this process. And I think it's really empowering to hear when you're like, I, when you hear someone say, I believe you, I trust you, and I want you to own this part of the process. I'll focus on this other thing, but I want you to own this. I think that's been really helpful and a really big change that I've seen in myself and something that's really helped me go forward with my team. Well, I appreciate how sort of open and honest you've clearly been with yourself, but how open and honest you were willing to be during this conversation. I think it it gives people a real sense of doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur or not, right? How you look yeah. at your team, how you handle your own challenges, how you reflect on on what's in front of you. I think right. all of us can take something away from that. Um, now, if people have met you through this conversation, um, they want to be your second, third, fourth, and fifth podcast interviews, Jason. <laughs> what is the best way for people to reach out and get in touch with you or to learn more about Mentee? Yeah, you can, uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn. My LinkedIn is just Jason Edmonds. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a self-described LinkedIn addict, so I'm on there pretty <laughs> often. Um, so you can, you can find me there. You can also check out us on our website. We're www.collegementee.com. So you can see what we're up to and the different work and updates that we're going on over there. Um, but I would say those are the two primary ones. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being with me, Jason. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sourcing Hero Podcast. Join us again next time for more true stories of sourcing and business heroism performed by your colleagues and peers. Look for The Sourcing Hero wherever you get your podcasts, and don't forget to subscribe. Finally, don't forget, sourcing heroism is taking place all around us every day. Keep your eyes open and you're bound to see it. Until next time, I'm your host, Kelly Barner. Stay well and always remember that you can be a hero too.